the way the way I see our problem today with nuclear weapons is that we have been left with a legacy from the nuclear arms race that is a similar sort of legacy than we've been left with from the Industrial Revolution. We have huge amounts of carbon in our atmosphere from our burning of fossil fuels that's now causing massive global problems with our climate. And we don't know how to reverse it. We don't know how to stop it. But we know we have to. With nuclear weapons, we're left with enormous numbers, thousands of nuclear weapons, um, tons and tons and tons of nuclear material that we no longer have any use for, that could cause equivalent global catastrophe to climate change. And we don't know how to deal with it. We just know we have to. At the end of the Cold War, we missed a great opportunity to deal with these weapons once and for all and to, to say, you know, whatever their uses during the Cold War, that period is now over. They were a weapon for their time, 1945 to 1990. And it's now, it would have been then the right time to get rid of them. The problem is that we didn't. And we're left with tens of thousands of these things. They have pretty well no purpose. And they're causing all sorts of proliferation type of desires because we've given them this power. And those that want to sit at the top table, as it were, feel that perhaps nuclear weapons will help get them there. And we've said, you know, that deterrence is something that will prevent war. So countries that are in regions of high conflict and high tension think, well, this could prevent war. And they have come to believe that if you have nuclear weapons, you won't be attacked by America. So we've essentially created what I would call the nuclear legacy. And we have uh, this leftover remnants of the Cold War. And when I talk to people in the military, off the record, of course, and we hear it, of course, from retired military experts, they say to me that they don't like these weapons very much. They don't like having them. They, they can't see how they could be used. Now, without boring everybody, <laughs> there's been a great body of work on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Unnecessary suffering, indiscriminate effects, huge catastrophic environmental damage, um, etc. And th they are indeed um, under that category of inhumane weapons. And so to apply international humanitarian law to them seems to me very sensible. During my time at the UN, what I discovered is that under international disarmament lawmaking, we've got very stuck. And we've got um, people in the room who don't want to get rid of their weapons, right? So the problem is that we have a system in which everybody has the same voice. And everybody can veto progress, even the smallest amount of progress. So those that have weapons and don't want to give them up can prevent any progress at all, even beginning of negotiations, even getting around to discussing it. Now, in the international humanitarian law uh, approach, you can be much more pragmatic and practical. And so a groups of countries can get together. They're called like-minded groups and form a new approach to a treaty. And so what I've been looking at is how we can do that for nuclear weapons. They have all the same characteristics. Um, and we have a similar convergence of interests coming together. And we still have a problem in that the people who don't want to get rid of them are able to block progress in the Conference on Disarmament or in the United Nations. So why not start a process in which we have countries that do want to get rid of them, including those that have them. And this is where it gets very difficult. And this is why President Obama's initiative is so important, because now we have the United States saying, let's get rid of them. And we have the UK agreeing. We have President Medvedev saying, yes, let's also get rid of them. Nobody can quite see how. But if we were able to get, for example, those three states, which don't forget, are the very three states that are the guardians, the depositories of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. 
if we could get them with countries uh, that feel passionately about getting rid of nuclear weapons, such as Ireland, Norway, um, New Zealand, Japan, Australia, uh, Chile, Mexico, you know, these countries, South Africa, um, who have fought for years for nuclear disarmament in the UN, in all the various negotiating bodies. If we can get a convergence of those countries with military experts, with non-governmental experts, with academic experts, and with people who have suffered from nuclear weapons. We have people from Japan, many of whom have, they're on, you know, the last decade maybe on this planet. We also, though, have veterans from nuclear weapons tests uh, who have been damaged by explosions, nuclear explosions. And so if we can bring those people together and see how we could forge a way forward to get rid of this scourge that we've been left with as, as a legacy from the Cold War, I can see how that might work. And so it feels to me that we have now a new opportunity to begin a process of seriously, systematically just dealing with this legacy. We can see how we can get down to very low numbers without changing very much. So let's just do that. That doesn't require any big changes in philosophy or defence structures or doctrines. Just get down to low numbers. And once we're at low numbers, let's see where we are. Let's get to that vantage point. Let's look at the lay of the land. Let's see the security situation then and then make a decision about how to get to zero. So this seems to me two manageable steps, going down to that point and then deciding how to get to the, the final point. And I, I can see we could do that.